Today, I'm speaking with Scott Burdick. Scott, thank you so much for joining me today. Great to be with you, Tim. And you are in the Appalachian Mountains or near the Appalachian Mountains. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, north part of uh, North Carolina near the Virginia border. Very cool. I'm jealous when I read that. I was like, wow, that's what a great place to live. And especially because you are an award-winning artist, uh, you and your wife, Susan Lyon. Your works are in dozens of museums all over the world. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your your artwork and what you tend to, to do for your art? Well, uh, my wife and I, we grew up in Chicago and we met in, in art school uh, quite a while ago, maybe 30 years ago. And uh, uh, so, yeah, we just paint now. So I started painting um, and I send my paintings to galleries and museums and things. And we take a lot of trips, uh, not this last year and a half. We've just been home, you know, for the COVID. But normally a couple months a year, uh, two or three months a year, we go to all kinds of places, uh, Peru, Tibet, Africa, um, all through Europe. And we'll, we'll just paint. We'll, we'll paint people. Uh, we were, were in India, I think, was our last big trip. Uh, we painted with a lot of famous artists there and traveled around the country and we'd have models pose for us and paint landscapes. And then we'll have shows of things uh, in galleries and stuff. So it's, mm. it's uh, been, uh, been really fun. It's a, it's a nice way to do it. And I also get to study those cultures. So whenever we go anywhere, we have an interpreter um, or I'll just hire somebody local there who can speak English and uh, I will paint and draw people and I will um, talk to them about their religion, about their history. And I read about the history. I read the books, the sacred books of those places. And I love talking about people, about their views on just everything, really. Hmm. That's awesome. And I picked up quickly that you really do a lot of traveling, at least uh, you know, previously, hopefully again soon. But you've traveled everywhere from Tibet to Namibia to all just all over the planet. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's I think art is the that's what I like most about art. That's probably why I, I chose not to take actual jobs in uh, in the film industry and things like that, which I early on kind of had this decision between writing for film and, and doing my painting. Uh, the fact that I could just travel and do my own thing, write my own things, do my own paintings, but also study the world and learn. You know, I, I think art is is not necessarily always just the point of it. It's the point of it is to get out there and meet people and you know, it's kind of one of the reasons why I did a few documentaries, because I saw these things. and I was like, I really want to share these kind of insights into, into stuff. And it's, it's been fascinating to really understand people's thought processes uh, that way. It's almost like you're mixing anthropology and religious studies all in that. It's just that's that's so amazing. It's, it's it, I got the real so. impression, both from your art and just from your all of your interviews that you've done and, and all the work that you're involved in you truly are what I would have called a renaissance man. You know, you just, you've got so many things and you're just, you're trying to take all this art that's like inside of you and in the world around you and just make it blossom. And it's, it's such a cool thing to see. And if I could add to just a few more things for your bio, uh, after you mentioned you travel all over the world, you're also a prolific novelist, including one that some people may have heard of the immortality contract. Uh, that is something that Netflix has renewed an optional one of uh, on your, on your novel there. And so we, who knows, we may see it on Netflix at some point. What is, uh, could you just give us a brief overview of what is that book about and anything else you've worked on, uh, published or that you're working on to publish in the future? Sure. Um, yeah, that one is, uh, that was my second novel and um, it deals kind of very much with religion. In fact, when I had done an interview with Richard Dawkins long ago, we had talked about it because I was actually writing it at the time, but it's based on the idea of, I got the idea first because of how religious people are always telling me, well, when you're on your deathbed, you know, you're going to, you're going to change. You're going to want to accept God because there's no other option. You know, you're, you know, so you're going to hope for this. And so that got me thinking about what if the deathbed option, the deathbed conversion was flipped? What if you did have another choice? And so the very opening of the story is a scientist who is bitter about religion. His wife was killed by religious extremists and his daughter. And so he has spent his billions of dollars over, over decades and he has solved uh, aging. And so he, if you take his pill once a month, you will um, age about 10 years backwards in you know, your physical age, your, me your, your memories, everything else stays intact. Everything else, you just, your body goes back to its, its prime. Uh, around, you know, mid twenties or so. And so if you stop taking the pill, you will start to uh, rapidly 
go back to your natural age, whatever that was, 90 or 50 or whatever, whatever you started taking it with. So you just have to keep taking this pill once a month and you will stay essentially immortal unless you get into an accident or something. Um, and so he says, I'm giving this to the world for free. Everybody in the world can have this pill um, if they want it. With the exception, if you have to sign my immortality contract, which says you are choosing science to live now healthy for as long as you'd like, but you cannot give any money, any financial support or public statements supporting organized religion, any gods, doesn't matter what it is. And it will also only be available in countries that do not uh, support religion. So in the United States, you'll have to get rid of tax breaks for churches. Um, all of these sorts of sorts of things you cannot promote, uh, you know, a religion in any way. And if you don't want the pill, um, and if you really believe in in heaven and hell or Jannah or whichever whichever uh, uh, religion you're in, um, why would you want to take the pill and delay your reward in heaven? So that's the very opening of the story. Is he's basically shot across the bow saying. You know, I'm giving you the same deal that the Catholics, that the Muslims, that everybody gives you. If you don't believe in our faith, you're excommunicated. You don't get everlasting life in heaven. That's basically what they say. So I'm saying, if you don't believe in science and you want to support it, you, can, you, you don't get everlasting life on earth. And he says, you can believe whatever you want. You can worship in your own, in your own home or anything, but you cannot give any money to support religion. You cannot promote it. And so he's basically trying to destroy all of the uh, institutions of religion, feeling that if he could do that, he would um, bring about this sort of renaissance of science and reason without all this money and all this sort of support for these organized things. So of course, that's just the very opening few pages of the book. And then it goes from there and you see the consequences of what happens. And so that's kind of it was kind of a fun, fun story. So yeah, that's fascinating. I, I look forward to. I hope hope they make it into a movie. And I've, great. I've asked people when I've interviewed them when I was writing this and I did some interviews. I would ask people. Um, and I asked Dawkins about this. I talked to him about because I was writing at the time. You know, if there was such a pill, would you take it? And of course, he says, "Of course, I would want to take it. I want to be physically, you know, um, uh, and mentally." you know, restored to, to, you know, I have no reason not to want to continue my work and stuff. Now, all, all the religious people that I've interviewed, they all say, like Ray Comfort and those sorts of people that I've interviewed, they all say, um, of course, I wouldn't take it, you know, because I want to go to heaven. And, you know, I don't want to delay, delay, you know, God decides when you die. And then you're like, well, but why did you have your triple bypass surgery? Why did you have this, you know, and that? And it's easy to say that I wouldn't take it when they know it's not real, you know, but if they were faced by that, kind of deathbed choice. Do I really, really believe that I'm going to heaven or do I have some doubt and I'd like to live on here? I think a lot more people would choose that because like Ray Comfort in my interview with him, he, he was very upfront about the fact that he didn't, hadn't read the Bible much or anything, but when he was in his early twenties, like 21, I think he said something like that. He was just terrified of death. He realized it's inevitable. And he just, it was this like horrible year he went through of terror about the fact that he was going to die. And then he met this um, preacher on a beach in uh, New Zealand, I think, because that's where he was from, who just said, you don't have to die. You can live forever. And this is how you just follow this book. And he said, I was converted immediately. So his conversion happened before he'd read any of the evidence or the proof, you know, so-called proof of the Bible. It was based on fear of death. And so for him, I, I feel like, uh, you know, that, that was, that's the, the main thing. And if you took that away, how many people would, would, there's uh, no doubt. And there's people in my book who continue to believe and won't take the pill, but there's a lot of other people who would want to li live young and without that fear, they're not as attracted to religion. So, so that's mm -hmm. kind of the idea of that story. And I tell it from the Christian, the Muslim and the atheist point of view. And so there's three viewpoints of that book. So you see all three really through the eyes of those, those sorts of viewpoints. And that was my intention with the book and book clubs that have read them and stuff. Many of them contacted me and said it was fascinating because they had people who, um, who were of all the different views and they all felt that the book really properly explained their viewpoint. And so they all had liked the book. And I think that's part of one of the reasons why uh, it would maybe be a good film and they're thinking about it because it's not just the atheist viewpoint. It really does show. In fact, I put in there 
some of the conversations I had with Richard Dawkins in the interview and, and other times I've just met him and we've had, you know, uh, meals together and stuff um, where he was always asking me things like, how come, how can somebody ignore all the evidence for evolution? He asked me one time. And, uh, and I, I put this literal explanation I gave him in the book, a Christian says it to another character in the story. He says, it just baffles me. I mean, that's just crazy. How could you ignore evidence like that? And so I told him, I said, well, think of it this way. If somebody accused you of, of, of murdering somebody um, in Los Angeles um, today, okay, they, this is tomorrow. And they say, you, you, and he said, well, of course I would say that's not true because I was here with you. And there's many other people who saw me here. Um, I said, but what if they showed videotapes? What if they showed fingerprints and DNA evidence that you were there? And he, and, he, and he said, all that kind of evidence. And he said, well, I would know it can't be true because I already know where I was. Um, and I said, well, that, see, that's, that's the way they think about it. You're, you're ignoring evidence because you already know the truth. And so they uh, are ignoring evidence because they already know the truth. And when I asked Ray Comfort, was there any evidence that you could ever see that would change your mind? He said, no because I already know the truth. And so it comes down to truth. How do you know truth, you know? And of course, Richard, he was like, that is really interesting because I hadn't thought about that. It's, it comes down to more of, I believe in looking at empirical evidence and studies for truth. And people are, other people are looking at this feeling in their heart that they know this is true or some vision that they've had. Uh, and so that's kind of how I wrote that book was to really see it even from the Muslim uh, uh, extremist uh, point of view. Um, if this is true, then what they're doing is actually logical and even moral. Um, it's a scary thought, but uh, you see this even with, with uh, scientists who, and so everybody in the story, even the scientists, the atheist scientists have different uh, kind of um, learning experiences where they see, see things from a different point of view later on in the story. So, mm. yeah. That's awesome. I definitely want to see that in the, in the movie. It sounds fantastic. Yeah, it's fun. It's in an audio book and it's, uh, I, I listen to books on tape while I paint all the time. So I loved having, it's one of my favorite um, um, book readers, uh, read it, um, Gabrielle DeCour and uh, Stefan uh, mm -hmm. Rudnicki. So it was kind of fun to have, uh, them. They, they read a lot of science fiction books that I, that the, my favorite science fiction authors. And so, so it was nice that their company asked to do the audio books for those. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I'll have the links beneath our video here if anyone wants to go pick that up, uh, either hey, buy thanks. it or listen to it. And you also, just to uh, finish up your bio, you also studied photography and film, and you did, you certainly take uh, photography equipment on your, on your uh, trips. You, in terms of your studies, you did uh, start at the American Academy of Art, and then you went to the Palette and Chisel Art Club, where you met your wife. And then in addition to all of the experience with art and, and, and writing, you also are a documentary filmmaker, including uh, documentaries such as In God We Trust and Three Days to Judgment. And could you just give us a brief, oh, before we jump into your story, could you just tell us what your, those films, uh, those documentaries are about? Well, um, I actually had, you know, I went to art school and uh, on a scholarship. And then I went, when I was started making a living as an artist, I went uh, to Columbia College in Chicago to study writing and photography and film, just because I was interested in them. And I did a little bit of film uh, back then. I did a little project uh, for DreamWorks and they offered me a job to work there full time, but I just decided I didn't want to live in Los Angeles. And so we moved to North Carolina and just did art. So I really didn't do any film uh, uh, after that time. So it was probably, I don't know, maybe 20 years later. And we were living here in North Carolina, moved from Chicago. And this controversy happened in King, North Carolina, or surrounding the Christian flag. They had, they had Christian flag and statues, and they would do all of these ceremonies at the at our local um, uh, veterans memorial. Uh, and uh, they had built this whole memorial, but they turned it into basically a Christian thing with public money, $400,000 they spent to build it. And so a, a veteran, Stephen Hewitt, complained about that and said, I'm a veteran from Afghanistan, and I don't believe that we should have... Uh, just the Christian symbols up. Um, I'm not Christian. Uh, and, uh, and they told him he was going to hell and they would pray for him, but they weren't taking it down. And so whole, uh, the, the city was threatened by the ACLU to be sued. And so they eventually took it down. And then this whole 
thing erupted. It was like on Fox News all the time and stuff. And they had 5,000 people there with Christian flags waving them in this rally. And all of these famous Christian speakers from around the country came. And somebody gave me a little uh, video uh, of this. And it was just startling to see all of these people screaming and, uh, and, and saying separation church and state is a myth that doesn't exist. And one of the speakers was uh, one of the famous Christian speakers from Florida or somewhere. He was saying, if you're, if you, if you're not Christian, you should move from this area should get out of town. And he said, and if you, and, he, and everybody's cheering and waving the flags, and he said, and if you know who they are, you encourage them to move, you know, in a really, really weird way, you know, obviously, what does encourage mean, you know, and so they, everybody was cheering and cheering, and people were then after that, they went around to all the businesses, and they told them, if you don't put the Christian flag in your business, we're going to boycott you, even like the the Indian family who ran the subway, you know, they had to put it up, you know, and, and so it was uh, startling to me, and so I had just gotten a video camera and uh, to do some art videos. And so I just started filming. Uh, I, for a year and a half, I went and I interviewed all of the people at the, at, you, you probably have seen it. So I interviewed people there. And I also then went to interview Christians. Uh, not, no, there were a few Christians who were against this move, but nobody would say anything on camera who were against the, the flag thing. And so um, I went outward so I could get other Christians uh, because they were, of course, every in town was afraid to say anything because they, they would be boycotted. They'd be run out of town. And, and I interviewed um, uh, Dia Murdoch Acharya on, on Christianity. And I interviewed um, the kind of uh, at Monticello, uh, the uh, foremost historian on where separation of church and state came from. And uh, so I did that film. So I just, it was just me with a camera and, you know, and some, some sound equipment. And then I put it on YouTube. It was at first it had to be 15 minutes because it was so long ago and in little clips. And it just, I mean, I just did it because I was really angry about that. And I wanted to um, just kind of say, I don't agree with this. I didn't expect it to be, become this big thing. It became widely shared in a lot of places. I asked to show it at film festivals and I never submitted it to any. It just, and a lot of famous people shared it on their websites. Richard Dawkins wrote about it. And um, so it became this big thing. And uh, the best thing for me was that that film was, um, uh, the film ends with the Christian flag going back up. They started this fake um, public forum, but uh, because of all the footage I'd filmed of, of public officials and all these sorts of people saying that if, if someone gets drawn in the lottery that isn't Christian, like an atheist flag or a Muslim flag or any of this stuff, will cancel the public forum. So it was obviously a fake public forum. So Americans um, United for Separation Church and State, uh, who I'd, I'd interviewed them in Washington for the film too, they asked if I could share all my footage because I had much more stuff than I could put in the two hour film. And uh, so they used that and they, uh, along with all the other things, they said, we finally have proof now that this was a fake public forum. We always wanted to challenge this, these sorts of things where they say, okay, well, public forum, everybody can submit and get a week. They can put up whatever they want. And of course, it's always only Christians because everybody else is afraid to do anything else. And so that took a couple of years to go through the courts and really just literally a week before I was supposed to testify in the federal trial here in Winston-Salem, um, the town gave in on everything. Their insurance company basically told them, you're going to lose. It turned out they had lied about all kinds of things. They, they, they tried to, <laughs> they had uh, uh, made up receipts, some of the people, and, and lied under oath, all this stuff. It was just a complete train wreck. And so the, the insurance company, which was on the hook for the for when they lose, said, we're not going to pay for any more, you know, if you lose. So the town gave in. Uh, it set a great precedent. They took down the flag and the statues and all this sort of stuff. And they had to pay, I think it was $500,000. The town's insurance had to pay to Americans United for separation of church and state. So it was just a wonderful thing. And uh, so, so I just, so it's not like an official documentary. It's just something I did and put on, it's still on YouTube and you can see it. And then because of that, I was asked to do the reason rally, the first reason rally. They asked, and I was like, well, I'm not really a professional documentarian, but they said, no, we'd really like to have you interview people. And so I interviewed them. So the reason rally film was on there. And I've done a few others and I traveled with the end times people, the Harold Campion's group that I did while I was filming in God, we trust because people came through 
Winston-Salem with these big vans saying, end of the world, May 21st, you know, I think it was 2010 or something. And uh, uh, I was like, wow. And, and people kept saying to me that I'd tell about what people were telling, saying to me in these interviews. And they said, well, they don't really believe all this stuff, you know, um, end times and all the crazy things that, you know, religious people believe. And uh, I, uh, I said, well, you know, these end times people, I talked to a couple of them, they, uh, they really believe they took their kids out of school, they quit their jobs, they're using all their money for like six months traveling around the country and people around the world to tell people the end of the world was going to be May 21st, May 21st. So I contacted them again and I some that some numbers I got from them and I said well can I travel with you the last three days of the world and so I I they said sure they really they were like but nobody's gonna ever see it you know why would you make a documentary on this and I'm like well I'm an atheist I don't believe this you know and I'd like to document it they said well you're welcome to come with us it'll give us more time to, to convince you that you're wrong and try and save you because that was again there it's almost a in some ways it's a moral thing they're trying to save people. But some of the people in the film actually said, well, it's actually not moral. We're doing this for ourselves because we're told that if we don't try and use every effort to save people, um, there's a passage in the Bible that they use like for the trumpets, you know? And um, if we don't let people know, then we're not gonna, we might not get to go get raptured. And so it was, a, it was a complicated thing, but so I traveled with them for those three days through Pennsylvania in their motor homes and uh, filmed them. And they convinced a lot of people. It was amazing how many people did they were, they were that idea. Well, what if you're wrong? You know, do you want to be wrong? You know, if tomorrow happens and it's too late, you know? And so it was a uh, very intense and very um, uh, heartbreaking to me because of the people with their kids and all that. It was just, it was just uh, very, mm -hmm. Very sad. In fact, when I told told Richard Dawkins about that, um, he uh, he said, "Oh, well, you know, that I don't feel sorry for them. I mean, somebody that's stupid, you know. I mean, to do all to believe something like that." And they said, "Well, what about their kids? You know, they take the." It was, "Oh, I feel horrible about the kids. You know, he was he just Richard just he the idea of indoctrinating children in these things and the effects that they have on them really does uh, affect him deeply." And he said, "Oh." I absolutely, that is just absolutely horrible. It's almost like child abuse, taking them out of school for six months and all this sort of stuff. And, um, but then I, I said to him, I didn't, I, I said that we talked about that during the interview I did with him, but later I said to him, you know, I was thinking about that. And the thing about it is you feel bad for the kids. At what point do the kids no longer feel, you feel sorry for them? Because I mean, these adults were indoctrinated as children you and you, Richard, wasn't as indoctrinated into religion, so he didn't have that burden. But a lot of the children, as they grow up, uh, they're just believing what they've always been told. And so it's and he and he thought about it. And he said, you know, that's that's really true. You really, I guess, I do feel sorry for them to, as well because they were, um, you know, he put it as they were they were kind of victims of of kind of mental abuse as, as children, you know, being, being put into this almost like a child who's brought up in a cult. And as they grow up, they just continue in this cult, even if it's, you know, hurting them or keeping them from, you know, achieving their own life. So yeah, like they were brainwashed, really. And it's just, yeah. when you start early enough, it's very, very difficult to even consider escaping. And it's funny because I felt so bad for them after the three days, I really liked all the people. And there were people there who were wealthy and people who were poor, all different things. And I knew this is really, really a reason why I'm probably not a good documentary filmmaker is because at the end, a lot of them were inviting me to come over the next day because they hadn't convinced me yet, you know, um, you know, that I didn't believe these things. And um, um and they said, well, come over, you know, you can film us, you know, and see when the rapture happens. Nobody will see the film, but, you know, maybe it'll be there for the people who are left, you know. And I knew this for a documentary, this is like the money shot where seeing the people during that day praying and then the realization that it hasn't come, it hasn't happened, that I've quit my job, I've spent all my money, I've alienated many relatives, everybody's going to be laughing at me. Uh, and that just, it wasn't true. I've spent years, some of these people spent years believing this. And that will probably be, that would be the crowning moment of a documentary like that. And I just couldn't do it. I was like, no, I, I, I mean, these people, I wanted to do this and put it in my film and put it out there on in YouTube, just as a kind of warning to show people the 
the kind of the psychology of, of, of these sorts of beliefs and dangers of them. But I, I couldn't actually, I mean, they've all signed release forms and stuff. So I certainly could have put it in a film, but it just felt too um, harsh for, for them. And of course, mm -hmm. when I did put it online, that's what everybody always says, but didn't you film them? You know, when they saw that they wanted to see like the kind of the, you know, the gotcha moment and I couldn't do it. And, and, and I, I had been, uh, these, these ones I did, I did just because nobody else was doing them. You know, I wanted the reason really, I told him you should have someone else do it. And they said, well, we don't really have anybody else that would, you know, that, that wants to do this. And, and, um, and so I did it because nobody else was doing it. Same thing with King. I just wanted to like expose this, I, these ideas. But, um, and luckily I make plenty of money from painting. So I don't need to worry about making money off of the films. And so even when I've been offered to do regular documentaries, people have seen these documentaries. I just say no, because, you know, uh, there was one like Sean Faircloth wanted me to direct this one that was on, you know, children who had been raised and abused in these, uh, churches that don't believe in medicine and all this stuff. And it just seemed too depressing to me and it didn't seem like anything new. And so, um, so that's why I'm not really, I don't consider myself a real documentarian. I just kind of, mm. with a camera, I sometimes film these things for, um, you know, for public, you know, for YouTube and stuff. So that, that's- it's, yeah. it's really interesting that you didn't get that last part of their, uh, the, the three days to judgment one, both just because it's, it's an interesting story, but it's also, it brings up something that I've been thinking about recently, which is just the idea that our, our goal is, as atheists or free thinkers or whatever, you know, people would describe themselves as, the, the goal is not to necessarily make people look like they're, they're idiots. It's certainly not, the, the goal is not to say you're, you all are so stupid. Right. Um, the goal is to say, we, we're going to take the high ground and we're going to hope the best, like there's a better version of you. If you, if you imagine it as a multiverse scenario or just the, you know, the future there, there is a you today that is stuck in a prison for your mind, but there, we can imagine at least a you that has escaped and that better you is, is no longer committed to, you know, genital mutilation or blood magic or scapegoating or whatever it is. And or the apocalypticism, there's a better you that we're going to hope for. And even those of us who have loved ones still stuck in it, it's very real to us every day. You know, it's like we we look at people that we know and love and care about, and we think there's a better version of you that that could happen. And our goal, our goal is really not to make you look stupid. It's to say, can we please to borrow the biblical phrase, come let us reason together. Like let's think about this. Does this really make sense? And to bring out a effectively bring out the best in them when the time comes when they're ready to to look at the facts uh you know straightforwardly and honestly and to you know to get over that cognitive dissonance that's so prevalent but that's that's awesome i'm very jealous i was i'll just add this and then move on i grew up listening to harold camping's radio station which was called family radio mm -hmm. i did not listen too much to harold camping per se but he had a radio program and I, I'll never rem forget how he used to do it. Uh, did you ever listen to him, by the way? I never had. I never had heard of him. Um, and as you saw in that documentary, everybody talked about family radio and how that's how they had been brought into this. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting that you had. Yeah. Well, he had this, what I used to listen to, what, what I remember most as a kid is they had a program where they would have someone come on and read the Bible, like without commentary, not a preacher, just a man with a really nice, crisp voice. And he'd read the scripture for an hour at a time and they'd play it. And I remember just as a family, we would sit on the, this, you know, our parents' big bed and we just all sit and listen to the radio, listening to this man read the scripture. And we'd maybe listen to 20 minutes of it before we, you know, the kid, his kids, of course, you can't, can't pay attention that long. But um, I remember listening to him and he had this way of ending his his talk call-in show where people would call in and ask questions and he'd say, thank you for calling. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to family radio or welcome to whatever his show was. And it, it, he would, he was, it was, you could tell he was a very awkward person. He was just, he was really, he couldn't like, he was, had a lot of verses on his mind, obviously, and a lot of numerology stuff. It was very big into numbers and, and pattern recognition. He loved that stuff, but he was very awkward. You got this sense that if you were at a party with him, he, you know, that he would never be the kind of person you'd expect to dance. He'd like, he'd have two left feet. He could never just feel comfortable. He'd always look, look like he's awkward. I would imagine, you know, otherwise it, I felt bad for the radio family radio program, because I think that he basically, he was one of many founders and the other gentleman must've either died or 
moved on, but he effectively became the de facto leader. And I think there were other people in the organization that were not on board with him at all, but they felt like that the rest of the family radio programs did a service. And so they didn't feel like they wanted to stop those. And they kind of put up with him and he became slowly worse and worse and worse with his imaginings of, you know, his apocalypticism. And I, I'm sure some of them had to leave because it got so bad, but I felt bad for the people that were not on board with him. But um, they did do some other things that were not as extreme. Well, and he's, he's interesting because uh, I've met people who are con artists, who are knowingly cheating people, uh, whether it's in new age or religion and stuff like that. And, and when I've talked to, J- I've done several uh, interviews and I just was friends with James Randi and he would talk about, uh, you know, the people he had exposed who were con artists, you know, he recorded them, you know, doing the trick, you know, and having earphones in their, in their ears and then, you know, doing these faith healing and pretending like they're reading their minds while somebody's piping in their ear what they'd heard and recorded when they came in and they seated all these people. So those are, that's a different kind of thing. But to me, uh, family radio and hero camping, he seems like the type of person who honestly um, believed these things um, that he was telling people and convincing them. And in some ways he was probably more convincing because of that. But the fascinating thing to me is it almost doesn't matter whether the person's a con artist or not a con artist. It's almost like, um, an evolutionary sort of survival of the fittest, like memes, like like uh, Dawkins uh, coined. Um, people want to hear something. They love mystery. They love magic. They love being told they're special or they're going to heaven or there's going to be this these incredible events happening, um, magic, ESP, whatever it is. They're all they're what people are attracted to. Everybody's attracted to them. You have to make a conscious effort to actually not have magical thinking. And so whether the person's knowing that this is what people want and is giving them what they want, like I would consider Donald Trump that sort of person. He really knows, he seems to be ready for any conspiracy as well, but he will change his message exactly. As soon as he realizes people aren't liking this, he'll change it to the opposite. Um, But then there's other people who just really believe these and you've got hundreds of other, hundreds of stories. Some people telling you the truth, some people telling you lies. And in some ways, the people who tell you the lies you want to hear, uh, whether or not they believe them or not, they're going to become the superstar. And I think that's what Harold Camping was. He probably wanted to believe this as much as his believers. And that's why he talked himself into finding these, you know, I mean, once you, you accept that this is true, that the Bible's true, and that this idea that 5,000 years after the flood is when end times is going to come, and then you kind of try to track down the exact age how many years it's been since then through all the genealogies and everybody explains that in there. It, it's logical, but your starting point has to be that the Bible is literally all true. And to me, that's the real problem. You know, that's, it's not trying to, the people who got the most angry at the end times people, when I was filming them, the most angry were other Christians who would say, you know, it says in the Bible, you can't know the date, you know, they're so angry. And then I'd interview them and they would say, um, well, no, I definitely do believe end times is coming, um, you know, in my lifetime, most likely, but we can't know the exact date. And that's why I thought they were a fascinating thing, because the fact that they put the date down meant they were going to be proven wrong. You know, almost never can you prove somebody wrong when it comes to religion, because it's so vague, you know, even if it's a faith healer, you know, thousand people can all not get healed, but then one person gets healed, and that's the one everybody talks about. And so here, the date, and then when I, I didn't interview people afterwards, but I called a lot of the people to see how they were doing, and not one of the people had in the film had changed their view. They all still thought the Bible was literally true. They just said, well, Harold Camping got the date wrong, but we're going to keep looking, you know, and it's going to mm-hmm. come, you know. And so to that's me, that's the real crux of it is how, what do you believe and why do you believe something? And, uh, and so arguing, like, I, I really just don't, care to argue with all the apologists on, on all these little detail things about, you know, where, where there are contradictions in the Bible, all this sort of stuff. It's interesting to read about. I read Richard Carrier's books and all the different, and, and you know, Bart Ehrman's and all that, but. And you have uh, a great and, interview with Carrier as well. I love that. That was. Yeah. I yeah. Carrier it several times. And Bart Ehrman and uh, Acharya. And it was interesting to me uh, reading those things and they're, they're fascinating to read and think about, but uh, it, it's like it's like Dawkins said, you know, this idea of whether or not Jesus actually existed or didn't exist is kind of, you know, uh, 
it's just a, a, a kind of sideshow to the fact of if he didn't rise from the dead, if, if, it, if the Bible isn't literally true in the Garden of Eden and he was dying for some, you know, sin that, ha- that supposedly happened because of eating the apple, which we don't, we know that that whole story is not, not literally true. Um, whether or not there was an actual core of a person um, doesn't really matter because yeah. if you don't believe Jesus rose from the dead and was the son of God, he's not really Jesus, whether or not it was a man that said some of the words or all the words like Bart Ehrman has books will go through, you know, some of the things we think were actually said by maybe a historical Christ. And then other things were obviously borrowed from these things. So it's like, well, I mean, how many things, if, 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 50% 50% of the things were said by a historical person who later got mythicized into Jesus. Does that mean there was a really a Jesus? What if only 10% of the things he said? Um, now is there a historical Jesus? I mean, how far down do you have to get to where you say there's no Jesus? I mean, so these are really kind of, they're interesting to think about how do these things arise, but almost impossible to know because there's no records of any of this stuff. Yeah. But at its core, the main point is you know, these things didn't happen. He didn't rise from the dead. You know, the, the, there's, it isn't these aren't literally true. You know, all of these stories, all of the myths were borrowed from other places and, and, you know, piled onto him, you know, turning water into wine and all those things. Uh, so that, to me, that's the main, the main issue, but uh, it's funny to see how passionate uh, when I've interviewed Carrier and Ehrman and uh, Acharya, how passionate they disliked each other, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, over these little differences of their, of their, um, their thesis is on whether or not Jesus existed or not. And all, it was just fascinating. And all of them had, had different parts of it where they seemed to believe so strongly in their view. Um, and, and there's so little evidence for any of it. I found it very fascinating. I liked all, all three of them. I liked a great deal. Yeah. And um, it seems like that's was, a big issue too, just in, in the entire community. I mean, I'm in, a, I'm in a lot of different groups where I hear arguments about historical versus, you know, yeah. mythical Jesus and, and all this. And, and where did it come from? Was it, you know, was it invented by the Romans? Was it invented by the yeah. Essenes? You know, who, who, who started the whole thing? But there, there is a lot of animosity. And at the end of the day, it, it really doesn't matter. It's not real. It's, it's, no, it's not that important of an issue. Really. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wanted mean, if I could. To, could yeah, I wanted to go back to one thing, if I could. You mentioned the idea that like some people had left the Harold camping group because they realized the date had passed and it was over, but they still stayed in, in Christianity. They're like, well, we just got the date wrong. It doesn't mean anything else is wrong. We just got this one piece wrong. And it's one of the most fascinating things. And I'd love to have your insights on this too. I'm sure you've got something to say about it is I have been in touch more and more as an atheist with groups of people who are still Christians, very much still Christians, but they have become more involved and made a platform out of looking at the churches and the pastors who are abusing the, uh, the privilege of being a pastor or whatever. They're, you know, taking patriarchy to an extreme. They're abusing uh, the, their flock, so to speak, where they're using their power, like the whole Mark Driscoll stuff. And um, certainly there's, there's other pastors that have been doing it that are, you know, on smaller scales. There's individual stories where somebody's get it, getting attacked personally, or maybe even, you know, there's, there's an assault that's occurred, some kind of crime and men in power who are otherwise you hope doing the right thing, speaking for God, so to speak in the, in the Christian community. And, and there, there are these groups of people are trying to expose them and say, look, these, these are bad men here, bad groups here. This is a bad church, you know, group leadership here. And one of the most fascinating things to me is, They never do kind of what I think we're alluding to. They never step back and say, the problem isn't that man and that pastor and that council. The problem is the whole worldview. You have a God who throughout the Old Testament and it well into the new, a God who says, basically women are like property. Um, You know, you can go in and slaughter everybody, but take the young virgins for yourselves as child brides or or worse. You have uh, God saying women cannot enter this, you know, the sanctuary, the holy place, they by and large do not almost ever hear from me. It's always the men hearing from me. The misogyny, you know, women are, are dirty and, you know, have to go outside the camp all the time because of the way that God designed their body. All these ways that men are in charge and, and, and the God character is psychotically against women. And then you get to the New Testament and you got, of course, these epistles, not probably not written by Paul, but in Paul's name saying, 
women need to keep silent in the churches. And I do not permit a woman to speak, but to, you know, have her head covered. And if she has a question, ask it from her husband at home. And you have all these ways in which the whole Bible and the Yahweh character and even Jesus, I mean, Jesus has a chance to elevate women. And this woman comes to him and what does he call her? He calls her a dog. And it's like, you have, you have all these chances to say women are so important to God and God, the Yahweh character and the Jesus character, the Paul person or character, all these people keep coming up to the plate and saying, women keep silent. We're repressing you. Men are important. You are subservient. And, and then I get, I see these people saying, why are these, these men of God not treating women right? And I'm like, your, your issue is not these individual, you know, 5% of le male leadership. Your issue is your worldview. Your issue is the Bible. You're not, you can replace these, you know, this, this percentage of bad men or send them to prison if that's what they deserve for some crime, but that doesn't solve the problem. Your Bible mistreats women. And it's a fascinating parallel. And I'd be curious if you've had any conversations well, with people about that topic. I've had many conversations about that topic. You know, the funniest part about it is, I mean, you'll see the cognitive dissonance of somebody like Ray Comfort or any of the fundamentalists that I know, and they will just rail against like ISIS and against the Taliban and these sorts of things, you know, and, uh, uh, and you'll be like, like you're saying, it's like, aren't they exactly like the Old Testament, you know, uh, viewpoint? Isn't that exactly that? And they're like, well, yeah, but that's a different time. I was like, okay, so it was moral, it's immoral now, but it was moral then. And so I'll ask him, so has God gotten more moral over the years? I mean, they had slavery, they had, you know, they, they you know, authorized, uh, ordered, um, you know, genocide and all this stuff. And it's just funny to put people in that box because, I mean, Ray Comfort's a great example when I interviewed him. Uh, and that's on YouTube too. I have him and Lawrence Krauss. I had them talk too as well and interviewed them individually. But, but I've asked so many people in my, in my films, I've had way over 50 now. I only put maybe a dozen of them in the film because I couldn't have it goes too long. But even our state representatives, I ask them, would you kill your own child if God asked you to, you know? And um, you probably saw it in God We Trust over and over people of different, many different religions too. Even Hare Krishnas and Muslims would say yes, if God ordered us to. And all, the, all of the books have that idea. And so it's, it's kind of an extreme example of the treating of women, you know, it's this idea that, you know, if God says it, he knows more. And for that time and place, this was the right thing to do. But Ray Comfort was funny because he would, he would keep getting cornered by these, these logic traps, like you said, talking about Talmud, well, how is that different than this? And when I asked him, would you, um, would you kill women and children? Like, you know, Saul was ordered to do the Amalekites and Joshua was ordered to do the Canaanites and all this stuff, or your own son, you know, like Abraham, he was willing to do it. God stopped him, but he was going to do it. Um, and he, and he was one of the few people who said, oh, that's a hypothetical. I didn't want, he didn't want to answer it, but he did say that, that they were doing the right thing in, in doing it because they're following God's order. So he said, killing women and children, uh, or your own child, if God orders, you have to do it. But then he said, I'm on an order to answer for myself, probably because he didn't want to, you know, have people see, hear him say, I would kill my own children, uh, as many people did. But then it was funny, because then he switched, he's trying to have it both ways. He's like, what? But you know, if, if God appeared to me now, and said, you know, kill your child or kill women and ch children, I would not believe it was him. And I would think, I would think, you know, and I said, well, you wouldn't believe that it was God. He said, uh, he said, well, you know, people have mental diseases all the time. I'd check myself into a, uh, into a psych ward or something, you know, um, thinking I was having delusions. And I was like, but those people back then, why didn't they question whether they were hearing God? He's like, well, we don't know. We don't know if it was a voice or this or that. I mean, it was like a circular kind of thing. You know, we wanted to have it both ways. And and then when you, I've talked to people and I've said, well, doesn't it make more sense that back then in the Bible, that was, that was lost by men, by people. And that was the culture that they had at the time, just like you see in many places that haven't advanced, you know, um, and say, no, that was from, those are from God, you know, mm -hmm. and slavery is the greatest example of all, because it, you might've seen it in, in God We Trust. I was interviewing, he's another very famous, wonderful artist named, named Brian Mark Taylor. And he, um, he said he would kill his own women and children, his own children. And they were just in the other room with his wife. And, um, you know, he's a wonderful moral person. I mean, he's a good example of that phrase, you know, 
but for religion, you know, good people to get good people to do evil things, you know, you need to have something like religion or some sort of ism, you know, uh, Nazism or whatever it could be. I, I see them as very similar. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, but then we talked about slavery and he had, he said, uh, I said, well, do you think it's moral, you know, to, to abolish slavery? He said, yes, you know, I do think in, in this day and age, we, it should be. I said, but you're saying morality comes from the Bible. The Bible never forbids slavery ever. You know, in fact, it okays it in the old Testament. Jesus speaks of it, but never says it's bad. He never says you shouldn't do this, just that people should obey their masters like slaves obeyed their masters. You should obey God as, as if you're a slave, basically. And he said, well, the thing is, as Mormons, I don't believe that we've gotten all the books. Some books were lost. And so I said, so you're saying that, um, that possibly the God or Jesus did abolish slavery and we've just lost those writings? He says, Perhaps, yes, you know, and uh, so it's like a way of having it. But then, of course, he had wow. talked about the reason why homosexuality was wrong and immoral because the Bible said, I said, well, how do we, how come we, how do we know then that uh, we didn't lose books that said homosexuality is okay? And that completely stumped him. He was like, literally couldn't think of a reply. And because, of course, you're constantly having it both ways with these things, you know, it reminds oh, that me. was the Old yep. Testament, you know, and, uh, you know, that, that things were different back then, you know, but it's like, oh, and maybe there were lost books that said slavery was bad. It's embarrassing that God never abolished slavery. I mean, it's so, you know, you get these ridiculous things. Uh, one of the things Dawkins had read about when he wrote about when he saw the film was uh, in God We Trust, was this one a female pastor who said that slavery was, um, that homosexuality is worse than slavery. And I asked her, well, why? And she's like, kind of exasperated. She says, well, because one is forbidden strictly in the Bible and the other isn't. So, so homosexuality is worse than slavery. You get these crazy, crazy things by trying to tie these things. People know that slavery is immoral. In fact, she uh, she was a fundamentalist minister in, in King here. And so it was part of that film. She was a big flag ab advocate, Christian flag ab advocate. And so when I brought up, when I asked her about the Bible okaying slavery, she made like a, a face on camera. She's like, God would never okay slavery. You, know, you could tell she knew instinctively that slavery was immoral. Okay. You could just see in, in her reaction. And I said, well, no, it says it right in the Bible. She's like, well, I've read the whole Bible. Where, where is it? And so I opened the Bible and I, I gave her the, I read her the passage, you know, and she, she opened up her own Bible, looked it up and she read it on camera. It's in the film. You know, you may, you know, God is giving, literally God is giving this order, dictating it, not just the prophet. You know, it's like God is giving these orders. You may keep slaves as long as they're not Jews. You can pass them on to your children. They're your property. You can beat them. Uh, yeah, I mean, you go, you go into all that, how much you can beat them. If they die, you know, then it's not great. If they live after a few days, it's, a, you know, so it's, uh, so she, she, to her credit, she was like, wow, I have read the whole Bible, but I guess I missed that part. You're right. He does okay slavery. So, uh, you know, under these circumstances, it, it, it is okay, you know, and, and so and yet she had had this instinctual thing. And so the fact that everybody n instinctually knows that that's wrong and the only it was us it was people who nobody claims that god had forbidden it you know um mm -hmm. muslims can say it's a good thing to free a slave but it doesn't forbid it you know and and because these are written by people it's so obvious that these are written by people and they're attributing them to god because it makes it people will follow those laws then and a lot of those laws were probably better at the time, they were probably actually progressive at the time, you know, to say, uh, okay, a woman who's raped has to marry the rapist, okay? Uh, we think that's, a, it is a horrible thing, but maybe at the time that woman would be just outcast and would just starve, you know, because now she's, she's you know, in that culture. So maybe the person who made up those rules are like, well, we got to moderate slavery. Okay, you can't, if they, you, if people are going to beat their slaves, but if they do and they die, then you're going to be in trouble, you know? So they're trying to like get a little better treatment for the slaves. It's like, it's like, you know, these compromises that, that are yeah. made, but that makes sense. If it's people doing that, trying to do that, it doesn't make sense if it's God, because if it's God, you know, he can just say, 
go right for the full moral, you know? Yeah, and don't own, don't own people. Know? So, but, you know, so, but that's the awkward thing because as it changes, you ask, you know, like I've done in the films many times, you know, has God gotten more moral? Because you love Jesus. You're always talking about that. But then you say, when I read the Old Testament, it's just like, like some of the people in the, in God, in, in the, uh, the, uh, the Harold Campion movie, it was like, they're like, God, when I read the Old Testament, it's just like, oh, so hard. They're killing people. They're doing all these horrible things, you know? And, uh, and I like Jesus more and the love. And then I'll ask them, you know, but if you were ordered to kill children, would you? And they still said, yes. You know, it was, it's just, it just shows how strong I have to believe this, even with all the evidence against it, even with all the immorality that, that it entails. And, uh, you know, but most people, they do, they just read the few parts that, uh, you know, that, that are nice. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, so. And in terms of the non-moral parts too, there's one, I'm sure you've heard this before, but just in terms of explaining where it all came from, the early church fathers were very upfront that they knew that it sounded like their stories of, of Jesus and what he had done sounded just like some of the other pagan demigods of that time. Oh, yeah. And they even said up front, like, look, why are you attacking us? Our God does the same thing your God does. So we're not that different. Right. That and, famous letter to the to the uh, Roman emperor. Yeah, yeah. but, yeah, but was, was sure. that, uh, that was Justin Martyr, right? Who wrote yeah, that letter but that too, explanation yeah. of like, well, God knew or Satan knew that that Jesus was going to do X, Y, Z. So he yeah. went earlier in history. The devil got these there first. Yeah. Fake, fake guys, fake gods yeah. and did the same thing. X, Y, Z for the, the, the demigod, uh, you know, know, Odysseus or I'm sorry, um, Dionysius or, or oh, whoever. Yeah. And then Jesus just kind of looked like to a muddy copy, the but... water. So it will look yeah. like we're stealing these old pagan things, but really the devil planted that. So it would look like we stealed it. Like, yeah. like, like I, like I, uh, you know, you, you, turn it hand in a term paper to somebody you know and uh, they say well you copied it from this guy you know and he wrote this last year i said yeah. oh the devil went forward in time and stole my term paper and went and gave it to that guy a year ago to make it look like i copied that guy's paper yeah. uh and we, mental we, gymnastics. We see your teacher one of the brothers i had at uh, catholic school say Oh, right. That makes sense. I see you are the, you didn't copy anything. It was him that copied it from you uh, a year before. I mean, yeah. if you apply that to the real world, it's just like, you know, I mean, it's, it's laughable. But you, you make a good point that the, the issue is not per se the, each of these little issues. It's the idea that people get instilled in them that, and they believe in it, that the Bible is the authority. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at even modern day churches where women who would otherwise never put up with you know patriarchy in the workplace mm -hmm. they would never let their um you know their 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 co-workers at, at their you know very in, you know right conscious workplace mistreat them that way but they'll put up with so much at church well mm -hmm. the issue is you you didn't they didn't start with the issue of patriarchy and misogyny and sexism at church they started with what is your authority and the authority, if it's the Bible, then it doesn't matter what you feel about it, how you feel like, oh, this is giving me angst. The issue is not your angst or the issue of what, sh what do we all think? The issue is what does God think? And if right. you really think it's from God and that that's why with all the philosophical arguments against God, you know, oh, why is, why does God let, you know, kids have, have cancer and die at two years old, blah, blah, blah. I feel like m one of the biggest parts that I want to contribute and I'm working on a project for is just to really expose where the Bible came from, you know, looking at the quotes and it's not like I'm coming up with it. There's, uh, you know, it's, it's out there. You just have to do the research, but it's looking at the, you know, uh, you know, Homer's work, the, uh, the Odyssey, the Iliad and the Odyssey, looking at Euripides, the Bacchae with all the great work from Dennis McDonald, looking at all the, the, the ways that it copies from Thagoras and from just so many endless sources and even from the, uh, the second temple Judaism books, you know, looking at the book of Enoch, um, the essential of Isaiah, the, the wisdom, uh, the wisdom of Solomon, the Testament of Adam and Eve, all these books that are quoted in the new Testament that people don't even know they're reading their new Testament. And they think this is like a new book that God gave us. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, no, this is a rewrite of endless other books. And you don't even know it. And so I'm, uh, it's a big is, passion is that of mine. What, to uh, is that what it. changed your view? Cause I know for me, I was brought up Catholic, Catholic grade school, same when my mother had gone to, everybody I knew was Catholic, and then Catholic high school, and it was in high school that I actually just read the whole Bible, which is not something that um, Catholics generally do, and, uh, and the brothers were kind of surprised and concerned, why would I be doing that, you know, I mean, they're giving us the passages, and, and, um, and then I read other books, I read 
other uh, sacred books, uh, the Book of Mormon, I read the Bhagavad Gita, I read various different, uh, and then histories of religion, like you said, and, and that was really what changed my view was seeing, wow, you know, everybody believed these things were true. I mean, you know, the Greeks believed in, they literally believed in the Greek gods that we think are myths now. And so seeing all of the similarities, I didn't have any like books that I'd, I read on like atheism. Uh, that was kind of way before that whole trend of it. There were, there were, I'm sure ones out there, maybe even back then, but it was really just the comparative religion, really looking at all these things that people believe and thinking about, well, gosh, if I'd been born in India, I'd be a Hindu. I believe that. Why do I believe this? And I literally went into it trying to, trying to prove Catholicism. And I read, I, you know, I read the Summa Theologica by, you know, and Thomas Aquinas and these sorts of things. And then I just saw, you know, not the whole Summa Theologica. I read like the abridgment of it because it's so long, but the arguments and stuff. And I was like, well, these are circular arguments. It's starting with God being true and then it's proving it through that. And, uh, and so that was when I lost my, my belief was in high school. And I never told anybody for years until I was in art school later. I met some people and uh, kind of pinned me down to say it. But, uh, and I said, I didn't believe. And people were so shocked even then, you know, how could you not believe in God? And is it, was that something for you? What, what caused your change? Uh, what, what caused the first seed of doubt in your mind? Yeah, it was very similar. And I'll, I'll keep it short because I know we're short on time, but um. The, the, the original seed per se that was, I, I wouldn't have said this was, would have led me to atheism um, or to even really doubt my faith necessarily, but I, I just became very concerned about the genocide stuff. Um, we're sitting around as you do as a Christian singing songs with your kids. And one of the typical ones was uh, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, you know, and the walls came tumbling down. And, you know, it's just this fun little kid song about you walk around the city and the walls come tumbling down and, you know, you can act it out and kind of the kids dance and just giggle. But I know, and you know, as we talked about what happens next in the, in the overall story, mm -hmm. they go into the land and commit genocide, land theft, slavery, um, child brides, and, and all kinds of horrible things. And at God's orders, he at literally God's orders. says, yeah, you are wasn't, not to leave any man, woman, or child alive. I mean, yeah, yeah, like, even animals. And yeah. I began to think for the first time in my life, even though I would, have, I would have easily said, I read those passages, I know them through and through. I know that this is from God. I wasn't, I had no doubt about what God had commanded. But mm -hmm. for the first time, it just was like, you know, like when you have a sore muscle or something and someone accidentally touches you like, Ooh, like that, like, don't, don't touch me there. I'm, I'm a little bit sore right. now. It just suddenly like my whole body just kind of went like that, that reflex, like, Ooh, genocide. Like, really? Am I, and, and realizing like in the, in seeing my kids right there, am I okay passing on to them this worldview, which is, it's not about genocide. You know, Jesus isn't all about preaching genocide, but it implies that that is acceptable with the Yahweh character. And um, that led me on about an 18 month journey to begin to dig and dig and dig. And I would say it was related to the stuff you mentioned, um, various aspects of it, but certainly comparative mythology was a big part. Uh, Richard Carrier played a uh, big part in, in some of the research and some of the, just the topics that he brings to the table. Uh, David Fitzgerald, uh, certainly R and Ra and uh, certainly, uh, you know, all the other big guns, the, the, the four horsemen and so forth, all, all the big people, I began to listen to them and they made points that made sense, but I still needed to really dig in. And I would say what really got me over the edge was realizing this, the actual literal copies, like this verse says this, 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 and this other philosopher said exactly the same words 800 right. years earlier. And once I realized that that was not an exception, like you, you see it you, when you're a Christian, of course, they don't tell you the whole story. You see that a few times in Acts where Paul says, you know, or he's speaking in the Areopagus and he's, he's quoting, like, like your poet says this, blah, blah, blah. And you think, okay, Paul is quoting this poet, but he specifically spells it out. We know what he's doing. He's just quoting somebody. But then where it looks like otherwise he's giving a direct, uh, you know, letter that is inspired by God to some you know, people in some church in some city, it looks like that is actually God speaking fresh, you know, a fresh word to that people that becomes the Bible, realizing that over and over and over before you know it, they're, they're quoting all kinds of other stuff. For example, um, one of the big ones was Enoch, you know, the Christians will gladly tell you Enoch's quoted two to three times in the new Testament. It's quoted a lot more than that, <laughs> dozens and dozens and dozens of times more. And once it all came together, and I would say the, the other one that relates to one of your interviews, uh, astrotheology. I, I know there's some really 
big names in, in the discussions that would downplay astrotheology. I respectfully disagree. I think astrotheology is, was a major player in this, from what mm -hmm. I can tell. Um, I think it's to deny it is denying a lot of evidence. Um, and I'm going to do some projects eventually to try to bring Acharya's work back to the forefront. But um, realizing that some of this is astrotheological. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I, I think blew some of the basic things are almost uh, universally accepted. There's so many. I mean, when you talk about why, you know, why that we celebrate Christmas, you know, on December 25th and the fact that, you know, this obviously just took over a lot of, uh, you know, pagan rituals for yeah. these, uh, these, these times, you know, the solstices and the equinoxes were all sacred things and they all became incorporated because they were, in fact, there was a book I read quite a while ago that was really interesting. It was about all the different saints that, uh, you know, older saints that were actually originally, you probably know this, European gods. They're yeah. gods of these all little European like towns or whatever. And so as a Christian church to go over, just like with the solstice, uh, you know, celebrations in, in for, for Christmas, you know, they couldn't stop people from celebrating. It was such a tradition, you know, and they had your traditional God of their village. So they would just uh, turn that into Christmas and then they would, you know, Jesus's birth date. And then they would turn these uh, local gods into saints. And so they would build a Catholic church there and they'd have the saint in the church featured. And then after, at first, people probably were just going there worshiping their God, but then their kids were all taught by the, by, you know, by the tradition and the priests and stuff. And so then they just forgot that this was the original God. It's just a saint. And then this is the real God. Um, all of those sorts of things are, are fascinating, you know, and of course, most everybody, you know, when they were living outdoors, they were worshiping the stars. I mean, you know, the Orion's belt and all those things, the three Kings, they make yeah. sense. Um, yeah. Whether or not they're true ex in exactly, you know, if they were, if the writers of those even were, were even knew that they were taking them from say the three Kings from these original things, you know, because there may be steps in between where those people turn the stars into, and they call them Kings, just like we do with, astrological symbols you know aries and all these sorts of things and and uh you know and then so then they're their step they're talking about the three kings but the people who wrote this this fiction uh of the three kings coming to jesus's birth and of course even that is contradicted in the bible itself you know and not even mentioned by other other authors but they might not even realize the original origin of the three kings being these stars or just as nobody one of the first talks i gave <laughs> in here, uh, even before I made that film, uh, a friend of mine who I think was having doubts, and he was in a church here in King, and asked me to speak. This is probably about, I don't know, 16 or 17 years ago, asked me to speak at their church at, at their Sunday group uh, about what it's like being, believing, being an atheist. And uh, I said, well, are you sure you want me to do that? And I said, well, a lot of them were teenagers and kids in high school and stuff. And then they were older, their parents and stuff. I said, well, you you better get permission from all the parents. I'm not going to speak there. And so he did. And so I went and I spoke and I opened with, uh, you know, at just as I kind of assumed everybody would know this, but I assume it said, you know, as just as Christmas isn't really the, the actual date of birth of Jesus, December 25th. And as I was going to go on, uh, a couple of the high school student says, well, you've just started with a lie now. You know, we, we, that's what we were told. Atheists are always lying about things. And here you're, everybody knows Jesus was born on December 25th. You're, you know, and, and, and I said, well, uh, you know, and I was like, luckily there was a few of the older people in there that said, oh, well, actually, you know, that is, he's, what he's saying is true. You know, that's not actually the birth date of Jesus in the Bible. It says, we think it could be in the spring or October. Nobody actually knows why. And it was so funny to see those kids who had, they'd all been kind of like that gotcha moment, you know, um, you know, look at, he, we caught him in a lie. It's first thing he said, you know, and uh, so the fact that they were like, oh, somebody saw it on the history channel or something like this. And that's true. And they knew enough about it. And, um, and so the kids, though, were just, they look like, I told them Santa Claus didn't exist for the first time, you know, when they were a kid, they were just were like, couldn't believe it. They were like, and, and luckily, hadn't those people been there, I probably would have not had much headway because, and, and so I explained why that had happened and the fact that pagans were still were doing this. And so, you know, it wasn't until like the 300s or so that that finally started, that they started to have that officially as a celebration. It was just simply to co-opt 
all of these uh, Roman, you know, uh, uh, festivals. So, and, but th that moment, those kids were just like stunned. Wow. All of a sudden this, if this thing isn't true, what else isn't true? You know? Yeah. And so that's, that's the, that's the problem with those, with those stories. And so, yeah, the, I, I love uh, some of the things like Acharya. It was fun meeting her. She was like the first person that I, I hadn't read that much about, uh, Jesus and whether he existed. A friend of mine who's a filmmaker uh, asked me, Alan how he mentioned, oh, you might want to interview her. She'd be a good person to talk about some of the historical things. And I, um, so I went out and interviewed her in Oregon. And uh, I, some of the other, she is, like I said, her and Ehrman and Carrier, there's all things with them that I don't necessarily, I think they're going a little too far, believing a little too much on little things. And she definitely has more of a conspiratorial bent. Um, and I think a lot of the things about the, the stars and these astrological things, they make perfect sense, you know, um, as far as uh, that. She goes, then she goes really further into like saying, this is a conspiracy. And I know from having met her, there were other things that she was very conspiracy minded, minded about. And um, uh, I, I, uh, one thing I, I didn't put in the film, but was fascinating. Um, I was recording it, it, it was before we were started to talk, but, um, but just as far as the conspiracy things about that, this was a plot done by the Romans that they created the gospel. Anything's possible, but I don't really see the evidence for that. I mean, it's, it's possible or not. Um, but one of the funny things is, is she had made a comment about atheists and, uh, and um, to me and, uh, and just said, uh, you know, I mean, if you want to believe you're an atheist and, you know, and there's nothing after life then well, you know, good luck to you or something like that. It was, it was very, very dismissive. And she was like, I'm not an atheist. And uh, I had asked her, well, you know, do you believe in a God? And I think she's a little bit more, was a little bit more, maybe along the lines of my wife, a little bit more spiritual, a little bit more into some sort of, you know, uh, you know, new age sort of a thing, but uh, she didn't really want to talk about that. She really just wanted to talk about her research. So I said, okay, well, I won't, I won't put that in there though, but I found it fascinating because I think a lot of atheists start off as atheists because of her books and yeah. ermines and carriers. And, you know, and of course for me, when I was starting out, there was no YouTube, there was nothing like that. There was no internet. And uh, so when I was in high school, so um, I didn't have now, I mean, guys, you can go on there and you can certainly see uh, all the things you're talking about and you can question a lot of people that have read some of the essays I've put on my website. Uh, so many people contact me later and say that was what started me questioning leaving Mormonism. They're mostly born again Christians or Mormon, Mormons, those sorts of things. Um, but awesome. they say what they would do is once they read these things or they talk to me, um, then they would go online and they would look up, you know, uh, things I'd said about Joseph Smith or about these things. And that wasn't a resource that I had. There wasn't really an easy way to, to find those things. And that's why I think books like, like Acharya's and, and Bart Ehrman's and all of them are, are just so important now. But yeah. as you see, I mean, the internet also is a great way to spe spread misinformation. You yeah. know, you, re you really see that with this election, with, uh, you know, questioning vaccines and questioning science and all that and spreading new conspiracies. And uh, mm -hmm. so it's a double-edged sword for sure. Yeah, I was just thinking, um, I believe I've got the book here. Yeah, I'll give a little plug for, uh, for that. For anyone that doesn't know what we're talking about, the uh, Christ conspiracy, there's certainly others. But Acharya is just her her work was so pivotal to so many of us. And it I love what you're the, the ways you're bringing this out, but I, I want to add to just one little snippet that from my experience as a Christian, one of the things that is is very, very it's like a, it's it's one of the biggest issues that I had once like a lot of us when we leave, we get angry at the experience. Like, why didn't you all tell us there was more information? Why didn't you tell us the other side of the story? Why were we kind of, you know, sheltered and, and why do we have all these blinders on? But from my experience, I was not just like growing up in church. I was number one, hyper interested in it. Meaning if you said, Tim, I want you to read 20 minutes of your Bible a day, I would read four hours. If you said, I want you to memorize 10 verses, I'd memorize a hundred. Um, I was a, you know, very, very successful Bible quizzer for those who knew and care what that was. 
um, I was in it to win it. You know, I, I would read biographies of, of pastors and, and, you know, devotionals, nonstop missionaries. I went to Lancaster Bible College to be a pastor. And uh, after a year of Bob Jones University and then finished up in Lancaster Bible College. And then I went to a mission school called New Tribes Mission, which is now called Ethnos 360, but to do uh, tribal church planting where people have a language, but they don't have a, a, a written alphabet yet. So you go and learn the language translate it but that even that school which was focused on missions was all about giving you the bible with all that background i mean you could say surely you knew some of this stuff surely and i would say to be honest unless i'm missing some memory somewhere i don't think anybody said anything i may have heard the word words epic of gilgamesh once maybe but that was probably the only thing i've ever heard of that would have said there's more to this story and there is, you know, as we both know, there's so much more. And to, to deprive people of that information, I mean, if you, if you really want to look at it and say, like, I know people, for example, that they would, they would look at the claim, I've said, I've claimed the Bible quotes, the or New Testament quotes the book of Enoch a hundred times. I would imagine some Christians that have never looked in that would say, no, it doesn't. That's, you're making that up. I have come across Christian Enochian groups that have done the same research and said, hell yeah, it does quote the book of Enoch a hundred times. This is awesome. We now have found a book that should have been in the canon this whole time. Now we are kind of more, we've got better access to more information to the, you know, a canon that should have been. You all are crazy that you don't include, you know, um, don't include uh, the book of Enoch or whatever, you know, they'd say, and, and some of them include, of course, Jubilees and some books from the, uh, from the Dead Sea Scrolls. But all they do is they just kind of expand their, their story a little bit and change it to adjust. But Either way, whether you want to stay in it and find a way to explain it away, or you want to leave like I did, that's it's everybody's got a choice to make, but it's right. not fair to deprive people of the basic information. Well, it's, it's hard Tell me where this thing came from. It's hard when you're in it, because when you're in it, you know, I, I was, you know, an altar boy. I really believed, you know, growing up, I didn't have bad experiences in the church or anything. So it was, it was simply just reading and looking for the truth that changed my view. But you know, if you really believe something like the Bible or the Quran or these other things, and you really believe that people are going to hell, you know, forever, and that it's going to destroy the work, and there's this good and evil and the devil trying to trick people all the time, it does make sense to censor what they're going to see. I mean, I'm for censoring uh, misinformation online, say, because there's all these people who are making up false claims about like vaccines and this sort of thing, literally just demonstrably provably false false assertions just like donald trump making false assertions about the election being stolen literally making things up and all of these people who are sharing things that are, are very dangerous for our democracy and so i mean i really want to have all free speech but when you see uh how dangerous this can be or a cult member say having access to your children to start indoctrinating them to join their cult i would say I'm not allowing that person to speak to my children. Um, and so this is the way, if you really believe in the Bible or in the Book of Mormon or whatever it is, I can understand their thought process about saying, well, that stuff's false. It's dangerous. It puts their soul at risk. Um, I'm not going to let them see it. So for what you say is information and freedom of information, they should know these things are facts. Um, I understand why they don't want to, because they really believe this stuff. So it's such a hard thing. I mean, that's why a lot of my books, I want one called The Truth Conspiracy. Um, and then the first book, uh, uh, Nahala, is a science fiction one. And they're all about truth. I'd say the common thing about all of this is how do you determine truth, you know, and then showing all the ways that you can be misled. And in my first novel, Nahala, that's my favorite book, really, and the most popular one. Um, uh, I play with that idea that, uh, that, you know, things that look like magic to us, that could be science. So if you'd taken something back in time, just like Arthur C. Clarke said, you know, um, go back a hundred years with a cell phone, it will look like magic or whatever it is, whatever device you're using. And so in the story, I still do get emails from people. What I do is throughout the book, and it's all about religion and science and, you know, it goes through a thousand years of history. It's, it's, a, it's a really much of a more traditional adventure science story, but it has all of these philosophical themes at its core. And so I, the very first time I have something happen, 
in the book. I don't want to give away what happens, but it's in chapter five. And something happens that's so miraculous seeming that there's no explanation except that this is magic, okay? And so I still now even get emails from people. Uh, most people will just read, read through that. And, but I get emails from people and they say, I feel cheated. I want my money back because I like science fiction, you know, it's hard science fiction. And this is under the category of hard science fiction. And here you've introduced magic in chapter five and magic is not science. You know, that's like Star Wars in the force. They'll, they'll go on. They get very passionate in science, science fiction on, on this idea. And so I always write them back and say, well, go on to the next chapter, you know, and, uh, and uh, I don't want to give away and everything. So throughout the book, so as you go on, then you realize, oh, there is an explanation, a scientific based explanation to what happened. And then each, throughout the book, each thing I introduce, it seems like there's absolutely no other explanation. There's no way. And people who love the book will write and say, I, once I saw what you were doing, I would come to the next thing and it was, I kept upping it and they're like, well, there's no way he can explain this one. That's impossible. It has to be, you know, um, and then I explain it and that's the fun, but that's what, see, that's the thing with, um, with when you're in it and you see something and it seems so obvious to you, you have to be a certain type of person who's willing to look like when I see these claims, uh, on, on vaccines or Trump or, or religion or whatever it is. I'm, I mean, on Facebook, I'm always just looking things up. I'm quick, do quick Google search. Okay, that's in, it's on both on both sides, liberal and conservative. People make up these things and they look too good to be true. And so you look them up. But that idea of research is what's what kind of underlies uh, a free society and freedom of speech. When you have people who are who are making things up in as, as compelling a way as they can to trap people or trick people, I think that you have to suppress it because unfortunately, most people, it can be dangerous. They can, you know, you're gonna get, you know, an uprising, you're gonna get this. With religion, it's especially difficult because I mean, you're brought up by your parents and you trust that they know better. You can't actually just research every single thing. And so it's very difficult for a state to say what, you know, we, we, everybody should have to have a comparative religion class, which, which would be, I would love to see that, that it's all comparative religion. You know, kids are taught that, not taught which is right or not, but just seeing, oh, wow, look at all these different things that people believe. But I mean, I, I don't think that you could force it on it. I mean, of course, that's what the immortality contract is about. It's trying to, you know, force, take away the power of the indoctrinators. And yet, um, there's a lot of problems with that, which I go through in that book. You know, it seems like a perfect solution. You know, just get rid of that. Everybody's be rational. But that's the problem is everybody's not rational. We don't make our decisions. Uh, uh, I mean, you have to be trained to do that. Or I don't know, maybe there is just certain sorts of people who, who just want to have someone tell them what to believe. And it's, I can see the comfort in that, you know? So, yeah. so easy, it's difficult. Easy answers. It's yeah, difficult. To, yeah. to take life with all its complexities of, how long am I going to live? Am I going to be healthy? Who do I marry? You know, children, what's right and wrong in this, you know, politics, so many questions. And to, to have an easy answer and say, the Bible is my well, answer. And the most frustrating it's, it's thing is probably, probably you've seen this where you, you say, I like you're talking with the book of Enoch or anything like that. So it's like, I want to show people this fact and this is going to change their view. And then it doesn't change their view. You know, I mean, I, I had somebody who was telling me, um, a friend of ours who who's who's was a big Trump supporter, this is in the middle of his, you know, near the end of his, uh, his uh, four years, and they're telling me how the deficit has gone down so much under Trump. He kept all his promises. He's lowered the deficit. By, and I was like, no, that's not true. The deficit's gone up a lot, you know, because of his tax cuts and things like that. And, and uh, they, they said, no, absolutely not. It's gone down. I know it's gone down. I've heard that. And uh, so I brought up on my phone the, the, the actual uh, statistics from the government, from Trump's, Trump's government that showed the deficit has gone up, you know, huge amounts more than any time before. And they just, they looked at it and said, oh, I don't believe that. And I was like, but this is the, the actual, where's that from? That's the government. Is that New York Times? No, it's the it's actual government statistics. There's, these are like facts, you know? I mean, we can have different opinions on whether that's good or not, but we can at least agree that the deficit has gone up, you know? contrary to what Trump predicted would happen with his tax cuts. And they just wouldn't look at the, the and they don't, and I have this over and over where you show people things in the interviews. It's fascinating to see how, like when I came back with the documents that 
this David Barton had made up, you know, about separation of church and state. People just wouldn't look at him. As soon as they realized it was something that went against what they didn't believe. And so that's why I, I don't usually get into where I'm trying to actually change people's minds that I'm talking to. I'll do Facebook posts and I'll do these documentaries and stuff, uh, but I know I'm not going to probably change the mind of the person, but it's more about other people who might see that. And so those are the people who write me and saying, seeing that and seeing the fact that they wouldn't even look at, look at the evidence really made me question what their view was, which is, was what my view is. So mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing. I don't think you can actually convince people yeah. um, uh, because most people, the belief comes first and everything else. Now it makes you, it makes me very, very paranoid to think of what things are I seeing? It's so easy to see other people's things and so hard to see your own, especially when you believe it so deeply or you have a financial interest in it. Or, you know, like some of the authors who write books on these various different theories about Jesus' life, they have a lot invested in this theory that they have. And it's just like scientists will have. That's why you have to have these peer reviews and stuff. Some scientists will get so caught because it's their theory, they're not actually looking at it rationally. And mm -hmm. so, we all have that. It's like a human trait and it takes like training to overcome it. And I'm always embarrassed. And I always make a point to thank somebody when they actually show me evidence of something that I really thought was true. That wasn't true. It's difficult, but it's like, I want to thank them because I want more people to do it. But yeah. I think that's really the way. I mean, if I, somebody, I had done a podcast with somebody else, it was on art. Um, and they had asked me uh, about, well, you know, all my stories were about, um, were about uh, truth. And they said, what would you want to do if you set up a school? How would you teach children to think, you know, to think and be skeptical, you know? And I said, well, I mean, I think the whole point is uh, not to tell people what to think, but tell them how to think. I said, I would love to have a class where, say, a history class, and I'd give people, give all the students, you know, uh, historical like you know a few pages of something that explained what happened in wherever you know a battle in europe or in the american revolution whatever the subject is and i tell them your job is to go through this and to tell me the things that are incorrect that are wrong that are literally made up or not true because then they have to go and they have to research they have to question every single thing that they see because they don't know how many things are not true? Is the date wrong? Is this whole thing wrong? Did this person not exist? Or am I slightly doing it? You know, I mean, I think that would be, that's, that would be, and that's kind of what I started to do myself in high school with the Bible and then with other things. And I, it made me much more skeptical about everything. And so I'm always, oh, why I love writing is researching these things. And I think that that's something that's not taught. It's something that in school, we're taught, listen to the teacher, listen to the preacher, read this book, just memorize it. This is the truth. And I think teaching skepticism and actually practicing it is, uh, is, is, is just so much more important than memorizing dates and those sorts of things. At least that's my viewpoint. Now, yeah. in religion, people are never going to want to do that. You know, they may, you see people who are very skeptical in other things, but that when it comes to religion, that's off limits for them. It's amazing how they'll apply very skeptically to the rest of the world and then they get religion and they just won't touch it, you know. Reminds me of that meme where the parents are <clears throat> talking about their little boy in the corner and saying, we need to really, really pray that that God will help the little boy get over his imaginary friend. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you can't right. see that. It's, it's just, it's amazing the cognitive dissonance. And I, I love that what you just said about, you know, teaching kids how to tear apart a text and see what's wrong with it. That's, mm -hmm. I've been working on some projects to kind of gearing up for a project probably a while from now. I want to do some good thinking on it, but just how to protect kids' minds and how to really help them to be skeptical, you know, right. even with people that you love and you trust. So you can still trust them, but verify what they say and, right. and have some healthy doubt. Doesn't mean you attack them, but it does mean that you say, I need to double check the information, especially if, if it's a small deal where it's not important in life, but if it's like, I am going to literally kind of uh, proverbially as it were swing out into eternity on this set of information, then this information better be absolutely completely watertight, um, you know, waterproof. And if there's any issues there, I have to 
have to figure it out. And, and one of the biggest ones that's amazing to me is as a Christian, and I, I'm saying this not just to Christians currently, but even to myself when I was one, it is so easy to explain away things like discrepancies where you say this gospel says this, this gospel says that, and you just, you merge them, you harmonize them. And it's like, you find, you find so many ways to, to figure out how to make it fit because you just, you just want to, but it seems like we, when you kind of put yourself, you rank yourself under the authority of the Bible, the Bible's your judge, obviously God is your judge, but the Bible is his book. So the Bible judges you, you don't judge it. You don't judge him to put yourself in the frame of mind to say, I'm going to become at least a critic and a skeptic, if not in a sense, a judge of it. Um, you know, the, the whole mentality of textual criticism, right. which when I was growing up was like a anathema. You don't question the text. You don't, who cares if there's a Q document or whatever, God gave us what he gave us. He wanted us to have this book. You don't go there. And to give yourself that freedom, it's very scary. And it takes a lot of bravery, to be honest, when you're, when you're out, you're like, it's not that big a deal. That's what you should do with anything. But when you're in it and you truly, truly believe like, like the Howard camping stuff, you truly believe it. You're not here to, to make money. You're not here to, to trick people. You just simply believe it wholeheartedly to, to, to step back from that edge and say, I wonder if, I wonder if there's more to this story. I wonder if there's something wrong here. It almost feels blasphemous to say it. You're like, oh, what did I just do? Did I just, did I just question God? Like you don't question mm -hmm. God, but it's, it's a, I've described it as like a really big, heavy door that's on very smooth hinges, um, you know, hinges that have been, you know, really well greased. And that door looks so big and so heavy. You do not feel like you could ever open it. But because it's the hinges are so, you know, it's like hinges all the way down. And it, it's so well greased that once you push it open, that thing just slides open. The weight carries itself. And it's, it's just, I've seen so many people say stuff like that, where once they realized this was an issue, it made them think, huh, well, if there's an issue here, maybe there's an issue here, maybe there's new, and all of a sudden it's like raindrops falling. And you're like, I am absolutely in a deluge of issues that I cannot ignore anymore. And eventually you give yourself that freedom. You're like, you know what, enough with this, maybe I'm blasphemous. You know, maybe I shouldn't question this. I need to know, is this real or not? And if you go down that, that line long enough, honestly enough, it's like a, it's like an iceberg. Like you realize you were looking at this little piece and there's a unbelievably bigger list of issues that you haven't even started on this well, that you see is enough to deconvert you. There is much more. And one of the interesting things though, to me, and one that I've dealt with in, in um, both the first two novels that I wrote um, is the question. There's a, this, that question you're talking about is trying to determine truth, you know, really looking at evidence and finding out what's true and what's not true. Then the other question is, um, will I be better off knowing the truth? And what if I'm a better off, I'm going to have a happier life, you know, happier family, all these sorts of things. If I just don't look too hard at these things that I, that is kind of gluing all of this together. And that's one of the things that the immortality contract is, is all about, you know, uh, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a, in the Christian character is, it's the main thing. Of, and I have an uncle that is, it's kind of, I was thinking of him when I wrote this character, she had been a drug addict and a prostitute and stuff and having a near death experience of becoming born again, Christian um, improved her life enormously, allowed her to do it. And I have an uncle who, who was an alcoholic. He was a numbers runners uh, for the mafia and all this stuff and a gambleholic and he lost his family and kids and all this stuff because of these things and becoming a born again, Christian switching from Catholic to that allowed him to, at least that's what he says. It allowed him this deep leaf, allowed him to stop drinking and gambling. And he got remarried and had another, another family that, you know, and their kids are much older now and everything. And so he, whenever he wants to talk to me about religion and stuff and help convert me, no, I won't talk to him about it because I think in he's not going to be changed his mind because obviously his life was so horrible before this and it has actually improved his life. This false belief, I believe it's false. Um, I can't know that for sure, but I'm pretty sure it's false. Um, but I can't deny that he is a better person. He's a happier person. He's a better father, all of these things because he believes it. He's not just faking believing it. He believes it. And I'm sure there's people who fake it for that reason, just 
I'm not going to talk about the fact that I don't believe I'm this, you know, just like all the people in the clergy project that, you know, Dan Barker and, and Richard and stuff started, you know, they realize, you know, this is just what I have to do to, for my kids, you know, to pretend that I believe these things and keep preaching. So that's a difficult thing. You know, it's like, would I want to deconvert my uncle knowing that he'll probably go back to drinking and gambling? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a moral thing. And so, you know, it's like sometimes you, you, you meet people who are artists or singers or, or you know, they, they're, they're, they're horrible singers, you know, and um, you see them, you see it when they go on The Voice and, it, you know, they're told, but then they still won't accept it. They're like, no, I'm in great. And I know people like this where, you know, they, they're not very good at this thing and it's their dream that they're going to become a famous singer, you know, but they're, they're tone deaf. And yet, they're wonderful at other things, you know, their, their job, their family, all this stuff. But this dream is so important to them that to shatter it, to prove to them that they are, have no talent and that they're terrible when they're singing in church and everything, but they just think they're great. And so you think, well, what's the harm? Let them think that they're that. Now, religion is more difficult because a lot of times the harm can be horrible, you know, it can be horrible to that person. Say you're gay. And you, but you believe that you have to do this and you can never, you know, have the, and I know people like that too, who are, who are very Christian and they are clearly gay. We all know that they're gay. They just simply cannot bring themselves to, you know, marry or to be with a girl. They try and, you know, all their best friends are, are, are men and, um, you know, and yet you, so you, you know, you, you, in your, my heart, I feel like if they would just realize that this is not true, they could be themselves. So there's, there, there, it's such a complicated thing, but that's one of the things that fascinates me. A lot of Mormon friends I have, I think a lot of these people are just wonderful people and they have wonderful families and this belief does so much for them. And, I, and I'll think, so what's the harm? It's great. But then I see, you know, they're voting for these people who are trying to impose religion. They don't believe in separation, church and state. You know, the, the church itself is, 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 is financing, trying to change the law, laws on homosexuality and all this. And, uh, you know, and so. And the issue, the bigger issue too to me is the, the virus issue where it's, it's got to replicate. You've got to give it on to the next kids and, you know, yeah. generation. And it's like, if you want to believe something yourself, that's one issue, but people never, ever stop there because they think I, and it, of course the, the, the implication of you need a savior is that you need one because you're a sinner. And now you're talking about telling kids they're wicked. Now yeah. you're talking about psychological child abuse. Well, and, and those like, kids have no choice. So I, yeah. I know I've had so many Mormons who have contacted me and said that my, the essay I wrote on my website is what started them to, you know, leaving the Mormon church. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, some of them left and they're still friends with people. And then others have left and their families have completely cut them off and disown them and will never see them. So it's a traumatic thing to, you know, it's not like the kids have a choice. You know, if somebody's making a choice, I'm going to do this, like my uncle, I'm going to do this because it's improved my life. That's one thing, but when you're forcing it on children, um, you know, then it's really, you know, it's really sad, you know, in my, in my view, but it's hard to know what to do, what to do about those sorts of things. It's very difficult to, uh, to think about forcing, you know, people to not have religion, which is why I was so fascinated about that, that the immortality contract, because he's trying to force people to do that, but they have to do it willingly. It's their choice, you know, but so he's not actually like using you know, military and shutting the churches or anything, but he's, he's trying to use this carrot, you know, like religion yeah. does the carrot of go to heaven, you know, live forever. Uh, and so I, I just find that a very complex thing. And I, I'm, I'm not as uh, like Richard, Richard Dawkins. He's, he's very much like if we could just educate children, I think he says in one of, one of the interviews I did with him, if we could just educate all children, you know, uh, on, how to think, you know, and question and these sorts of things, religion would be gone in a generation, you know, and everything would be great. And I, I am skeptical of that. I think people so much want these things. It's like these things become hard to believe now. And so you see the new age movement and, and you see all the people, John of God, all these sorts of people who, who abuse, who abuse this, you know, because he's giving people what they want. So I think they might very quickly invent a new form of it. So, yeah, but, it's yeah. another interesting corollary would be with the uh the matrix movies if even if some people knew found out you were stuck in the matrix now mm-hmm. you're free 
Right. But I'll give you, I'll give you a choice. Would you like to get plugged back in and never know you ever escaped that right. there was? Right. And I, I do think, I know I would answer, no, I, I would not want to go back in and I'd rather know the truth, even if the world is ugly and the matrix is perfect and beautiful and looks wonderful and heavenly, so to speak, I would not want to be plugged in. I'd rather know the truth, but I'm sure there, there are people who would say, uh, and people have told me as much like, no, I, if, if that's, if, if it's like ugly world or perfect world, but it's pretend plug me back in. I want the perfect world. Yeah. And it's, it's an interesting question. But I think it's one of the reasons why, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, religion gives you morality and stuff. And of course, all the statistics, when you look at the states, states in the United States and the countries in Europe, the ones that are the least religious, the most atheists have the lowest crime rates, the lowest child poverty, the lowest, all, all of these sorts of sorts, sorts of sorts of things. And so obviously their morality is very good because they're not committing murders and stuff like this. But I, I and so they'll, they'll say religion's causing, you know, people to be immoral, but I really think it's the other way around. I think it's the fact that when you're poor, when we go to India and we go to these other places, we see most religious people are the poorest. And that's the same in this country. Um, and I think it's because when you are hopeless, um, this is your only, it's like, why, why poor people buy lottery tickets more than rich people? It's your only hope, you know, a next life will be better and stuff. So I think, I think the real way to combat uh, fundamentalist religion, and I think the reason why the United States is more fundamentalist, say, than Europe, is by having more hope, uh, by having more hope in this life, by having good education systems. Our education system is ridiculous. I mean, when we travel, people are like, you seriously fund public education based on how much money the people in that county, that district have? I mean, but what about if you're in a really poor district versus a really rich district? You're saying that the rich district has a lot more money for their public school than the poor ones that need more help? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, that's crazy. And so I think that fighting those things, I think that's the real way. I mean, you see when people get wealthier, religion is not as big of a thing because they have things to live for in this life. And so I, I think that's the thing is it is scary. It was scary for me when I realized this is not true. It, you're all, like you said, your whole reality, you know, like the matrix waking up and realizing that was all completely, it's very much like the matrix waking up and realizing that whole universe that I thought I was living in doesn't exist. There is no God. There is no afterlife there. These things never happened. Um, and yet on the other end of that, it was so freeing. It was like, wow, okay. There's not some creepy guy watching me, you know, at every moment of my life, you know, there's not all, all these things that I can't do uh, just because, or I have to do just because of this. And uh, so that's the greatest thing is to let people know it's, it's so freeing, you know? I had more peace uh, in the first week in the first day, even perhaps, but the first week than I had in 43 years as a Christian. It's, it's absolutely true. There's so much freedom. And it's funny though, you just get some people that really struggle at first. I think I did my grieving beforehand, so to speak, but you see people that are like, I recognize that this isn't real. I couldn't go back if I tried to, I, I know Christianity is not real anymore, but this hurts so much. And, you know, you do, you feel bad for people that are going through that. I, I was spared yeah. that for the most part for whatever reason, but it's, it's, it's a painful process, but there is, as you get through it and you get grounded, um, especially if, if you have some people that are willing to, to love you anyway, um, you know, some of us have, you know, families where if you leave, they're going to be very, very, very angry at you and punish you deeply for it. But there's other families that'll be like, you know, we're going to agree to disagree. We still love you. But if you have any ver version of love and community, um, eventually it does get better. And um, yeah, I, I definitely appreciate your, your thoughts and all that. I know I've kept you longer than we expected here. So I should probably wrap up. It was great talking to you. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. I do have a lot more questions. So I'd love to um, touch base with you again, maybe next year sure. and Whenever do a follow up like. here. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Wonderful, wonderful meeting you. Hopefully I'll meet you in person someday. Yeah, likewise. Well, everyone, we've been speaking with Scott Burdick. I'll have a whole bunch of links beneath our video. Please go check out his amazing art. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant and breathtaking. The artwork that he has, um, his some of his articles, I'll have some links to his YouTube videos. Please go check them out. Uh, like and subscribe and all that. And Scott, thank you for what you do. It's, it's great to have you as part of the community. Thanks, Tim. It was great talking to you. Thank you. <laughs>